I mean, we're all bunched up here. Um, should we? Um, um, I don't know if they want the chair to sit in the chair. Okay. Where would you like them to sit? Yeah. Where would you like to sit? Sir, there's five where you normally sit. Um, there. Yeah. So all three of us would be you. here. But if you're not worried about that, we haven't been tagging people in committee meetings lately, so you can just sit and have fellowship with the floor. Well, the will be down here. Yeah. 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 Special guest for the day in mobile source. Yes. <laughs> yes, you are you are the uh between us. We don't have all the time. We have practice. We like it over here because we're close, we like it.
for those that are um, waiting, we're going to get started in just a few minutes. Um, just a couple logistics on our side. Thanks. Good morning, and thank you for participating in our remote meeting for the Mobile Source Committee meeting. We have two formats for participation, the Zoom web application, as well as teleconference. Please silence your other communication devices, such as your cell or desk phone, so that there aren't any disruptions during the meeting. During the meeting, all participants on Zoom, except for committee and South Coast AQMD staff, will be placed on mute by the host. That means that you will not be able to mute or unmute your lines manually. After each agenda item, the chair will announce public comments. For those on Zoom, if you would like to make a public comment on the Zoom screen, please click on the raise hand button. If you're using Zoom on your smartphone, please tap the raise hand button on the bottom of the screen. For those calling in using the phone line only, you can dial star nine on your keypad to signal that you would like to comment. Your name will be called when it is your turn to comment and the host will unmute your line automatically. Speakers may be limited to a total of three minutes for the entirety of the yeah, items on yeah, the agenda yeah. and three minutes for the non-agenda items. A countdown timer will be displayed on the screen for each public comment. Please note you can hang up or leave a Zoom meeting at any time. Please adhere to the speaker time limits and treat others with courtesy, civility, and respect. Failure to do so can result in your mic being muted or you being dropped from the meeting. And with that, uh, Chair Krakow, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Reese. Okay, welcome all to the April 15th, 2002 meeting of the Mobile Source Committee at the South Coast Air Quality Management District. It's great to be back in the auditorium. I haven't been here since March of 2020. I've had the opportunity to have one board meeting here and then it's been all Zoom and hybrid since then. So it's nice to be back. Hope everyone is healthy and um, having a good Friday and hopefully a good Easter weekend and Passover as well. So we have the agenda in front of us. Uh, the agenda has 10 items today. Why don't we start with uh, a roll call? Supervisor Kiel? Absent. Mayor McKellen? Here. Supervisor Perez? Here. Council member Rahman? Absent. Mayor Rodriguez? Absent. Chair Krakow? Here. I so, believe Rahman has just joined. Council member Rahman? She muted. Hold on. Council member Rahman?
Council Member Rahman. Should we proceed? I'm sure she's she'll join us once the IT issues are worked through. That makes sense. Okay. So Supervisor Perez, hello, Mayor McCowan, Council Member Rahman. Uh, let's go and then turn to the agenda. We have uh, three informational items today and three or four uh, written reports, and then we'll close the meeting. The first item is item one. We have Jeremy from the Air Resources Board, and the topic is interpreting recent trends in ozone and its precursors in the South Coast Air Basin. So Ground-based and satellite measurements over the past due to basin towards a chemical regime that will respond more favorably to NOx reductions over the next decade. So that's what the scientists are telling us. Jeremy is the chief of the modeling and meteorology branch at CARB and really uh, appreciate you being here today to um, participate in the meeting and educate us. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, so let me start off. What I'd like to do today is present some of the work um, that we've been doing at CARB, looking at interpreting recent trends in ozone and its precursors in the South Coast and the implications for our control strategies and attainment of the ozone standards moving forward. Uh, next slide. Okay, so let's start off by looking at ozone trends in the basin and what's motivated us to try and explain these trends. Uh, so going back to the mid 1970s, uh, we've seen a steady decline in both peak and hourly ozone, or sorry, peak hourly ozone shown in blue, um, as well as eight hour ozone shown in orange. Um, and what you can see is that the decline is relatively steady, uh, but there are periods of plateau due to meteorological influences. Um, but something happened around 2015 where ozone flattened and actually began to increase some. And so the question is what caused this to happen? Um, and that's part of what motivated this, this work. Uh, next slide. Okay, so from a, a high level perspective, we would say that the leveling off in ozone is due to a combination of meteorological influences as well as something happening with the ozone chemistry. Um, and I understand you've already heard presentations on the meteorological contribution. Uh, so today I'm going to focus on the chemistry aspect, um, but acknowledging that meteorology can play an equal or greater role from, from year to year. Uh, next slide. Okay, so let's start off with just a reminder of how ozone is formed. Uh, so simply put, ozone is formed through reactions between NOx and VOCs in the presence of sunlight. Uh, next. But the chemistry is actually a lot more complicated than that. Um, and this complexity leads to a relationship between ozone and NOx uh, that's really not very intuitive. Uh, next slide. Or, yeah, there we go. Uh, so one way to think of this relationship is like being on one side of a mountain and needing to climb to the top of the mountain to get to the other side. Uh, so here we can think of ozone as elevation and NOx as the distance you have to travel, sort of from right to left. Uh, so if you're on the right-hand side of the mountain and you want to get to the left side, you have to start walking. And in doing so, you're going to increase your elevation uh, before getting to the top of the mountain, at which point your elevation will start to decrease as you continue walking. Uh, so the same relationship holds true for NOx emissions and ozone. Um, as you begin decreasing NOx emissions, you can actually see an increase in ozone uh, until you hit some peak, at which point ozone will begin to decline. Uh, next. So this is what the relationship between ozone and NOx emissions actually looks like. Um, and we'll come back to this figure in, in a slide or two. Okay, next. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about the ozone weekend effect and why it's important to our discussion today. Uh, so NOx emissions on the weekend are roughly 20 to 30% lower than on weekdays uh, because of reduced truck traffic. Uh, so fortunately for us, VOC emissions don't exhibit the same day of week dependence that NOx emissions do. Um, and they're relatively constant from week, weekday to weekend. Um, and what this means is that we can compare ozone on weekends to ozone on weekdays to better understand how ozone will respond to changes in NOx emissions. Uh, next. Okay, so let's 
come back to the, the curve showing the relationship between ozone and NOx. So if we're on the right side of this curve in that blue shaded area, um, then as we decrease NOx on the weekend, we move up the curve and ozone increases. Next. So if we're near the top of the curve, um, where we transition sort of from the blue to the orange colors, then as NOx is reduced on the weekend, we expect to see little or no change in ozone. And next. Uh, so now if we're on the left side of the curve, then as NOx emissions are reduced on the weekend, we would see ozone decreasing as we move down the curve. Um, so keep this in mind as we walk through the next series of slides when we look at how the weekend effect has, has changed over time and how this response to changes in NOx on the weekend has changed. Okay, next. All right, so what I'm showing here is how the ratio of weekend to weekday ozone has changed over time for specific sites uh, where the blue colors represent higher ozone on weekends um, or the right side of that curve and the orange colors represent lower ozone on the weekends or the left side of that curve. And so what we see is that in the early to mid 2000s, the entire South Coast air basin was shades of blue. Um, ozone was higher on the weekends uh, when NOx emissions were lower. And over the next five years, most of the basin was still shades of blue, uh, but some sites had begun to shift into sort of those light orange colors. So they were, tr they were transitioning from the right side of that curve to the left side of the curve. Um, and not much changed from 2005 to 2014. Uh, but by the 2015 to 2019 time period, more recently, uh, more of the basin has shown shades of orange and the blue shades were getting lighter. Uh, and that's indicative of sort of nearing the peak of that curve. Okay, next slide. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, yes. Well, keep, keep going, keep going. Okay, so now when, when we shift into the year 2020, what we see is the entire basin is showing shades of orange. Um, so the question is what happened? Um, and simply put, it's our response to the pandemic, uh, which led to a roughly 20 to 25% decrease in NOx emissions between April and, and July um, of 2020. So VOC emission changes are more uncertain over that time period, um, but studies are, are suggest that they may have decreased overall, but um, not nearly to the, to the extent that NOx did. And so what that means is that the shift in the weekend effect was primarily driven by the reduction in NOx emissions. Uh, next. So now if we jump to 2021, uh, where things are mostly back to pre-pandemic activity, uh, we revert back to something that looks very similar to pre-2020. Um, though with more of the region showing shades of orange and, and some darker shades. Uh, so this gives us a window into what we can expect moving forward with continued NOx reductions. Um, and specifically that the, the plateauing of ozone that we've experienced in recent years um, is likely to, to stop and we'll begin to actually see a drop um, in ozone again. Uh, next. Okay, so I don't wanna go into all the details on this slide. It gets a lot more complicated than what we just walked through with the, week, the weekend weekday analysis. Um, but I do think it's important to note that we have also looked at trends in other indicators of ozone chemistry, uh, such as VOC NOx ratios, and that those trends are fully consistent with the weekend weekday analysis that I just showed. Um, so that gives us a lot more confidence in, in the, the weekend weekday analysis. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I've talked about NOx and ozone, um, but what about VOCs? And so the question would be, how does this curve change if VOCs change? Because up till now, we were assuming VOCs didn't change when we're thinking about the ozone chemistry. Um, so one thing I want to point out first, um, that's different between VOC and NOx emissions, is that unlike NOx emissions, VOCs have a large natural source uh, from plants that can be as great or greater than all of our anthropogenic sources combined. Um, so while we can control NOx to near zero emissions, um, even if we get rid of all the anthropogenic VOC emissions, uh, there would still be a, a, a huge natural background of VOCs from plants um, that would react with NOx emissions to form ozone. Uh, next. Okay, so reducing VOCs has the effect of um, essentially shrinking this curve um, as illustrated on the left at showing curves at, at different VOC levels. Um, but we can only shrink that curve so much before we bump up against that natural background of VOCs. 
Um, and it turns out that the natural VOC background from plants um, is actually large enough that even if you get rid of all anthropogenic VOC emissions, there's still going to be enough VOCs from plants to participate in ozone chemistry um, that you will produce levels of ozone that exceed the ozone standards, uh, provided you have sufficient NOx emissions. Okay, next slide. Okay, so just to, to summarize, um, the ongoing NOx reductions are shifting the south coast towards ozone chemistry uh, that will be more responsive to continued NOx reductions. Uh, the 20 to 25% reduction in NOx during the pandemic was sufficient to reverse the weekend effect. Um, and current emission estimates suggest that a similar shift is predicted to occur in roughly the mid 2020s, um, mid to late 2020s, so sometime in this decade. Uh, VOC reductions can be helpful in the near term, um, but will have a more limited effect in the long term. Um, and then I also want to say that, that we will continue to collaborate uh, closely with South Coast Air Quality Management District, um, as well as outside researchers to monitor these trends, um, as well as the evolving science. Um, and then I've provided a, a link at the bottom here to a manuscript that we recently submitted for publication, um, if anyone would like more detailed information on, on what I just walked through. Uh, so next slide. Um, and then I do want to acknowledge uh, everyone involved in the work across a number of divisions at CARB. Uh, these folks here are, really did all the heavy lifting on this work and, and deserve all the credit. Um, and with that, I will just thank you for uh, having me come speak today and I'll answer any questions you have. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Avise and uh, your whole team for putting together uh, this presentation and, and sharing it with us. Um, interesting uh, data uh, and conclusions. I'll open it up uh, to the committee uh, for some questions, and then we can take public comment and then wrap up. Uh, any committee members? I know uh, Mayor McCallan, this is a topic that interested you. Please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a couple of questions and comments. I'm, I'm not sure if the speaker uh, will be, will answer them or, or our staff, but uh, I have a question. You showed that mountain thing, and that brought to mind the, uh, the question about altitude. Does uh, altitude increase the concentration of ozone? Um, it's hard to say if it increases. Um, it certainly has an effect on the chemistry, um, because as you're higher up in, in the atmosphere, you're going to be exposed to higher energy. Um, you can think of it as higher energy you know, from the sun. So it can affect things, but it, it's really a combination of the sun and the emissions. So it's-, it's I bring it up because for example, the Redlands uh, station is at 1358 feet mm -hmm. while San Bernardino is at 1050 and they are fairly close to each other, but Redlands has higher levels of ozone. And the same can be applied to Azusa, which is at 610 feet while Glendora is at 715 feet. They're only five miles apart, but they have significant higher ozone levels. At, uh, so um, even those small changes, there seems to be a lot of difference in the ozone uh, readings. Yeah, I mean, some of that could be, and, and I don't know if, if folks at South Coast want to chime in or not, but some of that could be due to, um, yeah, changes in, in the intensity of the sun based on elevation. Some of it also is just gonna be um, on what, what local emission sources there are. Um, and so even though they're close together, if, if, the, the, if one site has you know, large VOC or NOx sources, that can affect things as well. On the weekend effect, uh, does, uh, on the weekend you would expect that vehicles would have a lot, a, a lot more cold starts of vehicles. And does that uh, contribute to the weekend uh, effect? Um, we believe the weekend effect is primarily driven by fewer trucks on the road. Um, if there are more cold starts, that certainly could contribute, but I think it's really the, the the reduced truck activity um, that's driving most of it. One, uh, uh, another question I have is, uh, you know, a major concern, 2020, uh, we, we've said that there's 20, 25% reduction in NOx. And uh, we've uh, had the worst air quality since 2003. 
For example, uh, in 2020, a total of 22 stations with the fourth highest eight hour readings exceeded the 0.084 threshold with 11 of those stations in Los Angeles and Orange County. This was the largest number of stations since 2000. Why would the basin have the worst air quality in at least 20 years? Uh, it is counterintuitive that 20% drop in NOx would result in the, in the most uh, fourth highest eight hour readings over the uh, 0.084 threshold in 20 years. And several areas in Orange and Los Angeles counties having the highest one hour reading in 15 to 22 years. Yeah, so I think there's probably a couple things um, going on. One is um, that if you actually look at the, the meteorology during that time period, we had some of the warmest conditions in early spring that we've had um, on record, I think, well, at least in, in recent years. And so we saw, we actually saw very high numbers or very high levels of ozone in the spring because of that. So there was a huge component to meteorology that was driving a lot of that. Um, from a chemistry standpoint, if, if it takes an additional 20 to 25% to get to the top of that curve, you could actually see increases in ozone. Um, so that's not inconsistent with, with what we know about the chemistry. But I do think there was a very strong meteorological component um, in 2020. And uh, that's something I keep hearing. It's all meteorology, but uh, you know that's sort of, to me, like saying, okay, there's a black box out there. I don't understand what's happening, but we'll say it's meteorology. That's what's... Well, Bother, bothering me is the fact that we see these increases when NOx is going down and uh, uh, it, we sort of point to meteorology and I, I don't understand. Well, that's why I think it's a combination of, of the meteorology and the chemistry. Um, and the two, those two are actually intertwined. Um, so one thing I mentioned was the, the natural source of VOC emissions. Um, when we're in, when we're sort of on the right side of that curve, um, ozone is affected quite a bit by small changes in, in uh, can be in VOCs. Um, and if you have really warm conditions, the, VO, the natural VOC emissions from plants increases significantly. So there's a very strong correlation between temperature and those, those emissions. So if you had warmer periods, you are gonna see higher emissions and more chemistry, more ozone produced. Thank you very much. Uh, good presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mayor McCallan, and really appreciate you flagging this for us and uh, asking for the presentation. And I also want to thank staff for being responsive to that. Uh, other questions from the committee? And I know that a member, Raman, is on the phone, although she's having trouble muting and unmuting. Uh, but you can always give it a shot, council member. Uh, but um, Supervisor Perez, any questions? Uh, it's just intriguing to try to figure out what all this means and try to understand it, you know, uh, and I've been on AQMD for a few years now, you know, so when it comes to the, you know, individual that happens to live in North Shore or Mecca or anywhere in the Coachella Valley, what does this all mean? Now, you mentioned something like, if it's hotter, you're going to have if the weather is, is warmer, you're going to have higher emissions. And I guess that might be the case here, right? I mean, we're below sea level around the Salt Sea area. And we get 120 degree weather. So, you know, moving forward, does that mean that we're going to see more emissions float this way from the LA Air Basin? Uh, is it just being created naturally because it's hotter out here and we're below sea level? I'm just trying to under connect the dots here, right? And it's just difficult to understand it all. Yeah, it, it's, it's, there are a lot of pieces to it. And unfortunately, you know, if, if when you have higher temperatures, you do have higher VOC emissions, but you also have things like higher mixing height. So there's more mixing going on in the atmosphere um, and that can dilute things as well. So it's, it's a kind of a balance between the two. And it, it is really hard to say 
which one ends up winning out in the long run. Um, if you have higher temperatures, that can enhance your chemistry. You can produce more ozone, but you also have more mixing. Um, and, and so it, it, it can be difficult to say. Yeah, so <laughs> there's certain things we can and can't do, I guess, right? I mean, we live where we live. Uh, it's a certain elevation. It gets warm. And I'm just wondering how or how do we create resiliency here? Like how do we how do we prevent um, more emissions? How do we, you know, what can we do to prepare ourselves and just make things better so that our pollution in the air is not as bad? Supervisor Perez, if I may, um, so the uh, ozone levels in Coachella Valley, they are very strongly driven by the ozone from South Coast Air Basin, both right. in terms of the ozone that's created in South Coast that is transported over, as well as the NOx that's generated in South Coast that's transported over that then reacts and, and forms more ozone. In general, Coachella Valley ozone levels are lower than what we see in South Coast, but the plans we have in place in South Coast that are going to get us to attainment will get the air quality cleaner in Coachella. I appreciate that. It's just uh, interesting and, and not common language that you hear on an ongoing basis, right? And so uh, as, we, as we move forward, and I know you're thinking about this and we've had discussions on this in the past, um, how do we deliver the message? And, and then, you know, what changes do people need to do in their everyday lives uh, that could potentially be helpful? How do we create resiliency in our communities? How do we fight back against climate change? In any event, I appreciate the presentation. I'm still learning here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Supervisor. Really brings it home. Uh, uh, Council Member Rahman, if you want to try to chime in. Oh, uh, Supervisor Kuehl is here. No. Terrific. Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So sorry I was late. Um, simply wanted to say um, it is difficult to kind of understand the, uh, the modeling, not because of the way it's presented, but because um, the science looks to be conflicted, but it looks to me like from what we learned today, we have a number of lines of evidence telling us that our strategy about uh, reducing NOx is actually the correct one. Uh, it's kind of frustrating that we have to get over that hump, I think they called it, before we see major improvements. But I think it's important for us to persist with this strategy. It seems to be the best one to reach attainment. So I just wanted to thank um, everyone for the many hours spent in, you know, the measurements, the computer modeling. Um, and I, I think my impression is we're, we're on the right track by the choice that we're making. So just wanted to indicate at least that's what the conclusion I come to. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. Good morning. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Avise, I have a couple of uh, questions. Maybe if, if we can, I'm not sure who's controlling the, the slides, but can we go to slide, uh, I think it's one of this presentation. It's the ozone levels in the South Coast. And again, thank you for joining us, Dr. Avisa. Next time you're down in the South Coast, we owe you a lunch or a good dinner or something. Uh, so I'm trying also to wrap my hands or my head maybe around this um, uh, question of uh, you know that that mountain concept that that you talked about, where by you can reduce NOx. But actually, the ozone might increase a little while until you're over that mountain. But so, looking here at this slide, um, we had you know tremendous NOx reduction strategies, you know for for forty years, 
and they led to you know marked declines in ozone. So it, it appears looking at this that we didn't hit that mountain or have to overcome that mountain you know, during this time period. Why did we hit that mountain in, in 2015? Is there something about that when you get real low that the, the lower hanging fruit or, or harder? Why, why did we just seem to face this mountain in the last 10 years as opposed to the 40 years prior? Does that question make sense? Um, yeah, I think, so I guess the way I would answer it is, so um, over the last 30, 40 years, we've seen this large reduction in NOx, but we've also seen reductions in VOCs at the same time. And so it's the combination of those two that's, that's sort of driving this. Um, and it's only until recently that we've driven sort of NOx low enough that we're now actually starting to get to that, that peak um, where, where things are slowing down. Um, which I think is what's driving that sort of the, the leveling off and even some slight increases, the, you know, a combination of what's happening with the chemistry as well as the meteorology. But it's taken this long to actually drive NOx that low um, to where we're actually nearing that peak. Um, whereas previously we were, we were just living on the far right side of that curve in that blue shaded area. Slide 13. So, you know, I'm not as quick as Mayor McAllen, so I'm just going to try to uh, uh, understand this here. So, so the conclusion here is that in 2020, we had less, less knocks because of the pandemic. And in 2021, we went back to the normal situation where there's less knocks on the weekends because there's less trucks or emissions or whatever. So the conclusion here is that because you have the red orange, lower ozone on weekends, that is telling us that less knocks on the weekend because of less trucks and less activity creates lower ozone on the weekends. And that's consistent with our conclusion that a NOx-based strategy works to reduce ozone. Is that what this slide is teaching us? Well, it's, it's, it's showing us that, um, the, that our NOx focus strategy has gotten us to the point where in the near future, we expect to see bigger and bigger benefits from that, that strategy. Um, and unfortunately, the only real strategy to, to reduce ozone to the levels needed to attain is a NOx focus strategy because of that natural DOC source. So, so what this is telling us is that the, the additional 20 to 25% NOx reductions due to our response to the pandemic was sufficient to push us sort of to that peak or over the peak. So that when we saw additional reduction in NOx on the weekends because of less truck activity, that we actually saw a, an improvement in ozone, a reduction in ozone, um, as opposed to prior to the pandemic, where a lot of the regions were sort of still on the right side of that curve. Does that make sense? Right. And then what you would expect is if, if this strategy is working is on the weekends, you would like to, you, would, you would see more orange or red because that shows that there's lower ozone on the weekends when there's lower knocks on the roads, right? Exactly. Okay. I understand. Is it interesting? Um, do you have any sense as to when we you know, may get over that hump, especially in light of the increased temperatures that are forecast in the era of climate change? So um, if I put my, my scientist hat on, I would say probably sometime in the second half of this decade um, is when we would, that's when we'll see the additional 20 to 25% reduction that we saw during the pandemic. Um, uh, and that's when we would get over that hump. So that's when sort of the the, the difference between weekend and weekend o's, weekday and weekend ozone would would shift to the left side of that. Um, so sometime in the second half of this of this decade. And that's because of the continued NOx reduction strategies NOx. that CARB and, and the South Coast are implementing. Correct. 
All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, we have public comment on this item. We do have one. Uh, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Peter, and thank you for this fantastic presentation. I do have, I'd love it if you could uh, just describe your the ozone chart that shows the thick black line with the ozone up and the NOx to the right. Maybe it's on slide seven or slide eight. Can you just describe to me what is the thick line? And I'm just thinking maybe I'm reading this backwards. I'm seeing increases in ozone are leading to a decrease in the line, but that doesn't isn't doesn't jive with what you said. And so perhaps I'm just not understanding the chart right. Is is this the the one with the curve and the blue and orange shades? Yeah. So is blue better? Because most of the isoplasts I see from the south coast, I want to get to blue and I want to go away from red. Right. So so this is um, this is similar to an isoplast um, that you've seen before, and but those isoplasts are they they show the relationship between VOCs. NOx and ozone all on one plot. And what I'm showing here is assuming we do not change VOCs. So just looking at the relationship between ozone and NOx. So and this so, isn't an XY chart, essentially. The black line is ozone. Is that what that is? Yes. The, you can think of the black line as, as ozone. Yeah. Okay. And then okay, Peter, there Peter, really isn't a Peter, Y axis. We're holding. Can VOCs you hold the commenter, please? So Peter, this, this is public comment. Um, why don't you get your questions out? I think they're well taken. And um, then we can, um, through the chair, direct the questions to Dr. Avise. So why don't you get your comment out? I, 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 I'm with you. I understand where you're going with this and Good. I, I, I will follow up, but why don't you finish your comment? I can follow please. up with Dr. Avise directly if that's better for you. Um, thank you very much. Other public comment? No others. All right, so going back to this, let's look at slide eight, if we can pull it up. And I promise we'll let you go soon, Dr. Vise. No, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer as many, answer as many questions. I as mean, we're, we're curious, right? It's better than not being curious, yep. right? So, okay. Can you, can you in, um, again, in layman's terms, explain this slide to us? Yeah, so, so essentially what, what, this, what that black, that thick black curve is, is it's the relationship between NOx and ozone, um, assuming a, a, a given level of VOC emissions. So whatever that is, we're not changing it. And so um, given that level of VOC emissions, if you change NOx, um, the response, the ozone response is going to follow this curve. So if you have a lot of NOx emissions, you're going to be on the far right in that blue shaded area. And as you reduce NOx emissions, you essentially climb up this curve. And so starting from right to left, as you reduce NOx, it's moving up this curve. And so ozone is increasing until you get to the, the peak in, at which point ozone starts to decrease with continued NOx reductions. Um, what you can think of, so I think most people are familiar with the isopleth plots. Um, Maybe, maybe this is gonna to get too complicated, but if you jump to slot, one of the backup slides on slide 21, I think. This is a uh, isopleth from the last uh, South Coast AQMP. So essentially what this curve is, if I, if I pick any spot on that isopleth, any VOC emissions and just drew a line straight up, that's kind of what this curve represents. So it's, it, it gives you the same information as the isopleth, but just for a, a fixed level of VOC emissions. If we go back to slide eight and then we'll finish up. So again, I do understand what you're saying is, is it, when you go from a lot of NOx to left to, to less NOx, you, you get this weird thing where the ozone increases until you meet that peak and then it goes down suddenly. But again, just explain to us, I think 
just to reiterate, why did we not see that for the 30 or 40 years um, prior? Uh, because we were very, very, very far to the right. So we were just slowly moving up this curve, but NOx emissions were so high that we were probably off this chart potentially. Um, but the reason we saw a decrease is because a de decrease in ozone over that time is because you had concurrent reductions in VOC emissions. And so that mountain was shrinking at the same time. So the VOCs play a very important role, but your conclusion is there's not a whole lot we can do to move the needle on those at this point? The, the VOC plays an important role um, in, in the near term. So if you reduced VOCs tomorrow, you would see a, a, a reduction in ozone. Um, the problem with focusing on VOCs too much is the level of NOx reductions you need to attain the standards are so great that um, once you get to that point, changing VOCs doesn't really matter. Mr. Chair? Yeah. This organization over the last two decades, maybe even three, did a significant amount of rulemaking in reducing VOCs, solvents from paints and coatings and things like that. And it was a recognition of the strategy that Dr. Avise is talking about, where if I recall almost 30 years ago, if you would have asked the leadership at South Coast, they would have said it's both a NOx and a VOC strategy. But as the VOC strategy was addressed through a lot of that rulemaking effort, the realization that Dr. Avise is talking about is that we have to have that NOx focus. That's why you're seeing the focus from where we are today. And it's all the challenges that Dr. Vese talked about, the climate, increased energy, increased temperatures, transport, all of those issues are affecting us today. But we are now at a point where that hump is becoming significant. But as again, Dr. Vese said, the scale is off. So we don't see how far right we were and we don't see how far we've come on this scale, but we see it on some of the other graphs that we've seen. So I just wanna point out that we have undertaken a significant VOC strategy. And we've shifted that strategy as we've been successful in reducing those emissions and as we are successful in reducing NOx emissions. Thank you, Executive Officer Nastri, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Avise. And I guess we'll have you back in the second half of this decade, uh, hopefully to be you know, popping the, the champagne as, as we get over that, um, that peak. Uh, really do appreciate staff and, and CARB for coming and, and, and Mayor McAllen for um, you know, insisting that we try to get to the bottom of this um, issue. And um, we may come back to you for additional questions. Dr. Vise, as we have issues with um, uh, our AQMP and, and other things, if, if we need that technical assistance, you know, uh, of course, uh, working with our staff as well. But Larry, anything further on this one? Uh, I know it's an important topic to you. No, I appreciate uh, the information uh, and uh... Uh, it'll take a while to absorb all of this and uh, as we move forward. And I, I appreciate uh, you coming uh, and giving us this information. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Vise and your team. Thank you. And perhaps uh, Peter's gonna follow up with you offline. Okay, colleagues, uh, we're gonna move on now to item two, update on proposed rule 2306 indirect source rule for new intermodal facilities. Staff will provide a status update on the rulemaking efforts for uh, rule, uh, proposed rule 2306. I think we have Dr. Shen, planning and, and rules manager. Uh, good morning, uh, committee chair and also committee members. My name is Elan Shen, I'm planning and rules manager. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to begin my presentation today with some background information. So rail yard ISR, similar to the port ISR and also similar to the adopted warehouse ISR. It began as one of the uh, facility-based mobile source measure uh, in our 2016 AQMP. And so this measure was designed to assist with the implementation of the state implementation plan strategy to reduce NOx and also PM through the further deployment of mobile source clean technologies, whether they're on-roll or off-roll. Uh, 
And back in May 2018, the board directed staff to initiate the indirect source rulemaking to implement this specific control strategy or MOB02. Next slide, please. And so there are really two main goals for us to look at uh, the proposed rule 2000, uh, 2306. So on the one hand, we know regionally, we need to reduce emissions by a significant amount from the real yard sources in order to assist with the meeting with the air quality standards both uh, proposed, uh, implemented by the state and also the federal government. And the real yard ISR, it needs to work in conjunction with all the existing and also the upcoming federal and state regula regulations and programs, as well as uh, local programs, in order to fit the puzzle pieces together to reach the end goal of regional air quality attainment. But on the other hand, equally importantly, we also need to reduce the localized air quality impacts to the communities surrounding these new rail yards. And very importantly, many of these communities, they are already disproportionately impacted by all the existing environmental burdens. Next slide, please. And so in 2020, staff provided an update to the board where we lay out some preliminary concept and approach in order to look at emission reduction opportunities from the existing rail yards. And why did we look at the existing rail yards at the time only? That was because back in 2020, there were not really any newly proposed rail yards for us to consider at that time. But in 2021, last year, BNSF, which is one of the two large class one railroads operating within our district. They proposed two new intermodal rail yards that will be upcoming in our region. And because of this, staff pivoted our rulemaking effort to really prioritize on the new rail yards, uh, intermodal rail yard facilities. And since July, 2021, we have held four working group meetings to look at this rulemaking effort. Next slide, please. And so we know that there are all the uh, different variety of rail yards. So there are classification rail yards, there are maintenance yards, and there are also these intermodal uh, rail yard facilities. And this proposed uh, rule 2306 will look at specifically these newly proposed intermodal yards. So what kind of yards are these intermodal yards? And so these yards are where the trucks, they would transfer the goods and cargoes onto the rail cars. And then the locomotives uh, would take these rail cars into or out of the, the rail yards in order to take them to the next destination. And so staff has been working with stakeholders to look at potential criteria in order to uh, figure out uh, what the applicability of the proposed rule 2306 will be. And so some of our initial considerations will include, for example, the potential cargo throughput at this newly proposed rail yards, and also the potential emissions that can be coming out from these new yards, and how close uh, the new rail yard would be to existing emission sources, including the existing rail yards, as well as how close these new yards are to our environmental justice communities that are already uh, overburdened by existing environmental hazards. Next slide, please. And so we know that the new intermodal facilities, they do have the potential to generate substantial NOx emissions. And those emissions will be coming out from different uh, sources. So they will include locomotives, cargo handling equipment um, operating on the yards, as well as the drawage trucks that will be taking goods in and out from the yards uh, in order to transfer to the rail cars. And they will also include transportation refrigeration unit, OTRUs. And so it is the primary authority of US EPA as well as CARP to regulate these uh, emission sources. But in parallel, our agency also has the indirect source uh, rule authority to regulate these indirect sources. And in this case, it's really those rail yards uh, that would attract all these different variety of emission sources. Next slide, please. 
And so with this uh, two newly proposed intermodal facilities by BNSF, we really see a unique opportunity for our ISR in order to ensure that the construction as well as operation of these new rail yards, uh, they will include measures that will minimize both air quality and also health, public health impacts. And they can do that by two major approaches. So on the one hand, they can implement technologies that are as clean as feasible. And on the other hand, they can also incorporate infrastructure building in order to support the more advanced zero emission technologies. And so all of these concerns and priorities that are also at the same time, the priorities of the AB617 communities surrounding these newly proposed rail yards. Next slide, please. Um, so the new intermodal uh, rail yard uh, that's proposed by BNSF at the Colton site, it is the component of our California high-speed rail project. So the idea of this as part of the uh, HSR high-speed rail project is that it's going to take that freight volume that is projected to be displaced by high-speed rail and put that freight volume at the Colton site, uh, at the Colton facility. And so at this facility, they are projected that it's going to accommodate about 10 freight train trips per day. And because of this new uh, train, freight train uh, activities around the Colton site, we also expect that there will be an increase in the local trucking activities that correspond to about 2,700 truck trips per day. And so this facility is actually located really close to two existing rail yards. So one is the existing uh, BNS rail yard that's a few miles north to the proposed site. And right adjacent to the proposed site, there's also another facility that is currently operated by Union Pacific OUP. And this, this new facility at the Colton site, they will be doubling the acreage compared to the existing BNSF intermodal facility over there. And so there will be different environmental documents uh, to comply with CEQA. So that those documents are expected to be uh, completed and released to the public sometime between later this year to uh, 2023. And it's really important for us to point out that, so this new Corton intermodal facilities once the draft, uh, the final EIR is approved, it does not matter. It is understanding that it does not matter whether at the end of the day, the high-speed rail project actually receives the funding to go forward and to be constructed. Then as long as the, the final EIR is approved, then the Colton Intermodal Facility can go ahead. And Dr. Shen, it's the, uh, who's doing the EIR? It's the High-Speed Rail Authority? Correct, yes. Thank you for pointing that out. And so another thing that we wanted to note on this is also that the uh, proposed Colton facility is located on the site that was previously occupied by Kill Poland, and there was a cement plant over there. Next slide, please. And so on this map, um, on this map here, if you look at the bottom, the bluish, grayish shaded area, that is where the proposed Colton Intermodal Facility will be. And what is not shown on the map is that that existing um, BNS facility that is located about five miles north uh, to the proposed site. And next to the proposed site, you will see that the long uh, rectangle area there in pink, that's the existing Union Pacific Rail Yard. And to the north and also to the east of this proposed site, you see that all these different uh, color-coded boxes, they represent a lot of elementary, middle, um, and also high schools, as well as uh, medical facilities. And those purple boxes that you see on this map, they are the residential areas. So you can see that the proposed uh, Colton site is really bringing the emission sources very, very close to all the sensitive receptors. Next slide, please. Um, so the other newly proposed rail yard that uh, by BNSF, that is the Southern California International Gateway or SCIC. 
And so this intermodal facility was contract, constructed uh, and also it is being planned by the Port of Los Angeles. So once it is constructed, it will be right adjacent to an existing Union Pacific uh, inter intermodal facility uh, that is ICTF. And I wanted to point out that the, fully, the full capacity of SCIC, it's 2.8 million TEU being processed per year. And at the ICTF side, right next to it, it is the same, once expanded, it has the same full capacity of 2.8 million TEU per year. So in combination, when these two sites right adjacent to each other are in full uh, operation, they will amount to 5.6 million of TEU being pro processed per year. And so these two facilities, they are again located very close to the ports, especially Port of Long Beach. And they are also within one mile away from multiple uh, petroleum refineries uh, located already over there. And so based on the revised draft EIR that was released last year, so it is estimated that because of this uh, new facility, we're going to see an, uh, an increase to the local community close to 3,000 train trips per year and associated with that about 1 million round trip, uh, round trip uh, by the drage trucks in and out of the facility. And another thing that I want to point out is also that the SCIC project is not new. It was originally proposed in 2013. Um, so the project was litigated by our agency along with others. And so our major concern is really that the air quality impacts that will be coming from the newly proposed skid yard, um, it does not have uh, sufficient mitigation measures in order to lessen the air quality impacts that might be associated with this new yard. Next slide, please. Uh, yep. And so similarly on this map, you will see that again, the bluish grayish shady area, that is where the proposed gig facility will be. And right to the north of that, that's where the existing Union Pacific Rail Yard ICTF is currently locate, located. And to the left of these two new intermodal, uh, the two intermodal facilities, you will see the approximately three large refineries located right next to the two rail yards. And to the right of ICTF and also SCIC, again, you see multiple elementary, middle, and high schools uh, with our children attending schools there. And at the bottom of that, you will also see the Century Villages at Cabrillo. And so that big complex, it is a housing facility for our veterans and also intended partly intended as transitional housing for our unsheltered populations over there. And so here I wanted to give a shout out to ECR uh, for environmental justice. So it's a local community organization. So we thank them for bringing staff to visit actually the Century, Century Village for us to understand the operations there. So when we were there, we also see that their onsite childcare facility will be located right across from the newly proposed skig site. Next slide, please. And so based on publicly available information, we see that there are several uh, air quality components for these two newly proposed rail yard projects. And so for both uh, facilities, uh, the air quality components mainly focus on zero emission or electric uh, cargo handling equipment. And so we see that for the cotton side, they expect that the, the on-site cargo handling equipment will be fully zero emissions, but not the case for the skig site. And so over there, they include, even though they include the electric gantry cranes, we also see that they propose LNG field yard trucks and the switch sweeping in order to lessen the uh, PM impact. And so what we do not see in any of the public documents is any air quality components that would be addressing the bigger emission sources that would include locomotives and also the drage trucks. Next slide, please. And so we have quite a few uh, air quality concerns. And so the key concerns are really that, as what I mentioned in the previous slides, because we do not really know if they would plan to propose anything to mitigate the emissions coming out from locomotives and trucks. And so we are really worried that like the, the additional activities uh, because of the trends and also because of the trucks, 
it's going to increase the local impacts at least and potentially uh, also increase uh, its impacts for our regional air quality. And I also want to point out that even though the newly proposed rail yards, they are intended to relocate the activities from the existing sites, existing rail yards, and the associated uh, rail and also drainage truck activities to these new sites. But then these existing rail yards, they are not going away. So they are still there. And so there is a potential that when you combine all this capacity together, there's this potential for all these rail yards to accommodate new growth in cargo throughput. And very importantly too, is that what we emphasized before, both of these proposed rail yards, they are located in the environmental justice areas. Um, so all these areas already are disproportionately burdened by the air pollution, as we can see on those two previous maps. Next slide, please. And so we did receive uh, quite a lot of uh, stakeholder feedback from our working group meetings. So from environmental community groups, uh, they did request that we will make public health central to rule making, especially consider that it's going to impact those environmental justice communities uh, that are already impacted severely by the existing rail yard sources and also all the surrounding emission sources. And they would like us to expedite rural development for both new and existing rail yards, and ideally by this year, the end of this year. And they're also asking us to require that the new intermodal rail yards would be fully utilizing 100% of those zero emission technologies. And finally, they would like us to have robust community engagement during the rule making process. And from the industry, we did hear from them that because of the projected efficiency gains by locating these new facilities closer to either the ports or the Inland Empire facilities. They believe that through the efficiency gains, there will be emission reductions that will be associated with that. And on the other hand, they also indicated that their projects already included all the feasible measures that can be included in there. And finally, we also have technology developers and OEMs coming to our working group meetings to share with us their knowledge and uh, suggestions. So the technology manufacturers, they see opportunities with this ISR rulemaking effort. But then their biggest concern is that the implementation of the zero emission technologies is going to take time to be implemented. And also that they are concerned about any of the supporting infrastructure that would be needed to support these technologies. Next slide, please. And so currently staff is working diligently in order to develop a rural concept. So there are a lot of key considerations that we have during the uh, rulemaking process. And first and foremost is really the air quality impacts from these new rail yards, um, both from the regional perspective and then also the impacts that it might have for the local EJ communities. And in the meantime, we need to take into account all the state and federal regulations and also all the, all the authorities, whether there are any limitations or like different ways that we can, we can look at this um, emission reduction projects in conjunction with all these other existing upcoming regulations and programs that are in place there. And of course, it will be very important to consider the availability and also the feasibility of cleaner, including zero emission technologies. And finally, we need to understand the business model of this industry, who owns, who operates all these different emission sources, and potentially which entities might have um, influence on the decisions in equipment deployment and also the infrastructure building on site as well. Next slide, please. And so staff is going to continue our effort to develop this rural concept. And we plan to bring it back at the next meeting to share it with the community members. And we'll continue to visit these new rail yard sites and also the communities surrounding these rail yards. So we've been to the communities uh, close to the SIGIC site. And next month, we are also expecting that we will be visiting the communities surrounding the Colton site. And we also want to thank the railroads because a few years ago, they also took us to tour their existing rail yards to help us better understand the on-site operations. 
and we're going to continue with working group meetings, uh, continue to engage stakeholders and conducting other public engagement activities. And we'll be reporting back uh, in about two months to the mobile source committee. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shen. If there's any uh, clarifying questions, we can open that up or comments to the um, members of, of the committee. Mr. Chair. Mayor McCallum. Thank you very much. Uh, could we go back to slide eight, please? Slide eight. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Good. Thank you. High speed rail has no concern uh, with uh, what they're doing to the Inland Empire to San Bernardino County. Uh, the idea of moving, you know, this uh, BNSF yard out to this uh, already impacted uh, uh, EJ communities in the in the area is, is just insanity. First of all. Notice that little red thing down there, Colton, you know, the intermodal can be built regardless of whether high-speed rail built at all. Once they complete this environmental document, BNSF can proceed to build this intermodal facility. And there's no mitigation included in the high-speed, by the high-speed rail for all of the congestion that's going to be caused by these 2,700 truck trips a day uh, out of that facility. Our uh, SBCTA, our transportation authority has been uh, putting input into them. The, the fact that uh, the impacts this is gonna have our, our uh, infrastructure in that area will not be able to handle all of those trucks, regardless you know, of the uh, air pollution impacts it's gonna have the congestion is just gonna be horrendous because there is no mitigation included in their high-speed rail uh, impact uh, uh, report, environmental impact for doing anything about providing uh, the appropriate infrastructure in and out of the facility and in that area. So uh, we are very concerned that the uh, environmental impact report is going to be approved and BNSF will be able to, to build that facility regardless of whether high-speed rail ever comes to this area. And it's going to be severe impact on our, our county and uh, we've uh, been letting everyone know that and I would hope that AQMD would also weigh in on the, on the congestion issue and the lack of mitigation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor McCallan, for uh, pointing out the issues and impacts to your county. Other comments from members of the panel? Questions? Okay, why don't we open this up for public comment, please? We have one public comment. Hello, can you all hear me? Good morning, Mr. Logan. Good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Krakow and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Angelo Logan. I am a resident of Long Beach, California, and a member of the Moving Forward Network, as well as uh, a member of a number of other environmental justice organizations in the region. I just wanted to um, encourage you all to move expeditiously on this new rulemaking for a number of reasons. Um, one, for new rail yards, it's, it, it's vitally important. But I also think that we need to include expanded rail yards as well for many of the reasons that staff presentation explained in terms of the opportunity and events in zero emission technology. Uh, it's important that we include in this rulemaking 100% uh, zero emission operation in all new and expanded facilities. Um, it's really important in the extent that, to the extent that in the design process of the um, new facilities, that there's opportunity to ensure that the facility is 100% uh, zero emissions 
and that we look at not just the individual pieces of equipment, but also the operations. I also think it's important, for example, with the SCIG um, rail yard, that other facilities that are uh, associated or that would service that facility be included in rulemaking, such as the Sheila uh, maintenance facility. Although it's not as part of the SCIG itself, it will be servicing SCIG locomotives and should be included, or all facilities that are servicing that new facility should be included in the rulemaking. Um, I also want to um, say that the rulemaking should be ha should happen expeditiously so that the requirements of the rule are included in the environmental review of these particular projects, whether it's CEQA or NEPA or otherwise. And then lastly, I want to encourage you all and, and, and urge you all to move expeditiously, not just on existing, I'm sorry, not just new and expanded, but also existing um, rail yards in the basin. As you all know, the cancer risk is extremely high um, near these rail yards and in overburdened communities. Um, our communities, our families, our neighbors' health depend on rulemaking like this. And we know that South Coast and many other folks have been working on this issue for over 20 years. The time is now to take action. And I want to encourage you all and thank you for moving expeditiously. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vogan. I see Supervisor Kuhl has her hand up, but why don't we go to the other commenter first, if that's okay, Supervisor uh, Chris Chavez? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is Chris Chavez, Deputy Policy Director at Coalition for Clean Air, as well as a Long Beach resident as well. Uh, I, I wanna echo many of the comments that Angelo Logan just said and urge the district to move expeditiously as it relates to the passage of a rail yard ISR. Uh, already, as you know, has been said many, many times, uh, the South Coast Air District remains out of attainment. The South Coast Air Quality Management District uh, remains out of attainment of national and state air quality standards. And diesel particulate matter is the number one air toxic contaminant in our uh, local area as well as the state as a whole. Uh, so certainly would encourage and, and support the district moving as quickly as possible as it relates to this uh, rule, as well as really help you know, designing the, this rule along with the ports indirect source rule and other rules and regulations to really put you know, the district on a viable path towards attainment of those air quality standards. Uh, I, I also agree uh, with the comment about uh, making sure that we're including uh, existing rail yards as well, as that's where the pain is being currently felt uh, by folks who live in communities. I know East LA, uh, Southeast LA are particularly impacted by rail yards. The ports area is particularly impacted by rail yards. Uh, and it's really important to make sure uh, that uh, we're addressing the current problem as well as future problems going forward. Uh, one thing I, I would also uh, certainly hope to see is uh, you know making sure that you continue to engage with the community, uh, both environmental and environmental justice groups going forward. Uh, I appreciate and, and really want to commend the staff for reaching out per, uh, early and having starting some of the initial conversations uh, with those stakeholders uh, in this process and really uh, reaching out to folks about this. I'd also encourage in, uh, inclusion and involvement with the AB 617 community steering committees, uh, which are uh, many of which are impacted by rail yards. And ultimately, um, given the AB 617 community emission reduction plans, uh, the rail yards, in my opinion, are very are inconsistent with those plans. When you have a rail yard being put in the uh, San Bernardino Muscoy area, where you have a rail yard being put in West Long Beach. Uh, Carson Wilmington area. Uh, I, I will be. I live just downwind of where the SIG project would be, and I'm very concerned about what the impacts are going to be on my my personal health as well as the health of my local community. So certainly want to support the district in its efforts, support the district in creating a strong rule, and doing all it can to reduce both smog forming pollution, but also toxic carcinogenic diesel particulate matter as well. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chavez. Uh, we have to uh, clear this room pretty soon for stationary source. So let's close the queue and we'll finish up with these public comments and keep moving through the agenda.
Next is uh, Jesse Parks. Hello, my name is Jesse Parks and I'm Sierra Club My Generation Advocate Intern. We appreciate that staff listened to our concerns and opened this meeting with a discussion of public health and impacts of rail yard pollution. And also we wanna thank you for acknowledging the concerns raised in the letter from environmental community groups. We hope staff will continue to make public health the central focus of this rulemaking process by adopting a strong ISR for new and existing rail yards by the end of 2022. Making this rule 100% ZE only, trucks, trains, TRUs, cargo handling equipment, and visiting speaking, and by visiting and speaking with communities near Skig and Colton Row Yard sites. Permanently assigning a public health expert to this rulemaking, we look forward to learning more about each concept staff propose and sharing our recommendations and feedback. Staff must ensure this rule is 100% zero emissions only, including ZE trucks, trains, TRUs, and cargo handling equipment. The Air Districts needs to move very quickly to adopt a strong rail yard ISR rule for new facilities by, 20, by June 2022 and for existing rail yards by October 2022. We simply cannot wait any longer. We need all trains in the South Coast regulated by the end of 2022. Lives are dependent on this and we need this rule urgently. So thank you for the time to comment. Thank you, Mr. Parks, and we'll go to Mark Lopez. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Um, you know, this is a, a tremendous. Mark, you might have sorry. muted yourself. Sorry. Yeah, I think I did that. Hey, everybody, uh, sorry about that. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yeah, so, you know, I, I'm very thankful of all the work that um, so many community members and agency staff have put in to really get us to this point. Um, and I really want to invite you all to, to take on uh, the sense of urgency that we feel on the ground. Uh, just yesterday, I opened my front door to invite some, some fresh spring air into my home and was immediately met with emissions from a train. Um, that's, that's my everyday reality, right? Every day in our communities, we're reminded that there's so much more that needs to be done. And so um, every day that we don't advance these rules, that's another day of, of us getting slapped in the face with these emissions, with our health being impacted every day, right? And so I just wanna make sure to um, extend that reminder right, extend that, that we continue to be here, continue to participate, um, continue to, to offer everything we can to this process um, and appreciate the staff who are advancing along with us um, and just really want to, to impress on you all the, the urgency of the matter. These are our lives. This is, this is our health, right? These are our children, these are our families, these are our communities that we're talking about here. It's not just a, a stat, it's, it's an everyday lived reality. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lopez. We'll open this back up to members of the committee. Supervisor Kuhl. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I was uh, reflecting on the request made by so many uh, of our groups and individuals about zero emission technology and uh, we hear also that um, manufacturers are excited, but not necessarily ready uh, with all of the different kinds of zero emission technology we might need. So I guess my question to staff is, um, could we require zero emission infrastructure at these um, sites now? and then phase in the requirement for zero emission equipment as it becomes available? Or does the equipment that they would be purchasing have such a long lifespan that we somehow need to get it right, right from the beginning? Uh, and I, you know, this is not the only arena where we kind of face this. So I wondered if there was a way 
to look at the rule um, kind of from those lenses. Uh, good morning. This is uh, Ian McMillan, Assistant Deputy for uh, Planning. Uh, you bring up a really good point. It's one of the things that we're really looking at with this rule uh, and others as well is what is that zero emission infrastructure component? We think it's an important piece, uh, especially when thinking about a facility-based rule like this. Uh, I think what we can say right now is that we know that uh, or we're expecting that the rule will have a phase in to it. It's not going to be everything all at once. Uh, there's going to be a phase in component. That's just how technology works. So that we think can provide some level of flexibility. But th the question you're raising, I think, is a really important one that we're still grappling with as staff. Uh, but that's, yeah, I think you're, you're asking the, the exact right question. Well, I think it's important also because there will be planning beyond our agency for um, the generation of and availability of electricity, because this is, seems to be the answer in the early part of this century to everything. Uh, make it electric, make it electric. And that does require, you know, more thinking. So I think if, if we could require the installation of infrastructure, of course, that could be changing too, I understand. But um, anyway, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Supervisor. Other members of the committee? Just a couple of quick things before we move on to the next item. Uh, and maybe these are questions for the lawyers as well. Uh, the Colton project, it, it looks here, um, maybe for you, Dr. Shen, but uh, the same slide that Mayor McCowan identified, slide eight, it says a record of decision. Uh, does that mean there's a federal component to this? Um, yes, it's indeed also a federal project. So it's subject to both NEPA and CEQA. So are they going to come to us for some guidance and determinations on, on federal conformity? Um, I believe there's already this process going on, especially with our CEQA teams. Okay. This is a very key place for the South Coast to engage in this process is the conformity determination. Um, you know, these should not be handed out like hamburgers at McDonald's. This is a very big project, especially if it's basically an expansion, taking one rail yard and making it two. Uh, that conformity determination should be looked at with a fine tooth comb. Another Mr. chair. Yeah. I would just add that um, really at the urging of Mayor McCallan and Supervisor Rutherford, we have been engaging with um, San Bernardino County and transit, as well as um, SCAG. And so the three, Ray, myself, and Kwame have been uh, very aggressive in pursuing HDR and what they're trying to do. So we're working on the very aspect that you're talking about. Great, uh, that's a, a real important opportunity for us to uh, impact the uh, environmental sustainability of the project. Uh, and I guess we would also be commenting most likely on, on the EIR and the NEPA document as well, correct? Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, other questions from anyone on this one? We'll see it in a couple, three months. Look forward to continuing the rural right. development concept, Dr. Shen. Thank you. Okay, this will move us on to the next item. I know, um, we're going to get kicked out here by a stationary source soon, but since I've got Larry here, maybe they'll treat us nicely. Uh, item three, discussion regarding multiple air toxics exposure study mates. Staff will provide an update regarding the development of mates, which was most recently updated in August 2021 in timing of the next study update. I have to confess, this is a little bit of deja vu. I thought we just went through this very recently, but... Um, Go ahead, Dr. Reese, explain to us why it's back. Good morning, Chair Krakow and members of the committee. So yeah, we did go through MATES very recently. In August of this past year, we uh, uh, presented the fifth version of our MATES study. Um, so that was all wrapped up and finalized. Um, but if we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, you know, we had a request at Stationary Source Committee uh, last month 
um, by a business representative to start the next iteration of the MATE study. And it's not a bad question. Um, when you look at MATES 5, the base year, so the base data that we used to address uh, uh, or develop that study was from 2018. And so the thought was, well, now it's 2022, perhaps you should start again. Um, you know, MATES is a very complex, comprehensive and complex study. There's a lot that goes into developing the monitoring data, the emissions inventory data. Um, it, it comes up with a very comprehensive view of cumulative risks and air toxics risks in the basin. We look at over 100 pollutants. It involves over 60 staff working on it. Um, again, most recent study was done in, in August. Our recommendation is that we, it's not timely for us to start again, but um, we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the components that go into MATES to get a better understanding. Next slide, please. So there's an air monitoring component. We do a year long monitoring campaign at 10 sites where we look at a, an extensive suite of air toxics. There's also an emission inventory component that we uh, develop a very comprehensive emission inventory. We use the information from our last AQMP to go into that. And so the uh, vehicle activity data, for example, in MATES 5, that was from our 2016 AQMP. You guys are aware that we're in the process of going through our 2022 AQMP that's being developed. We don't have revised activity data that could inform uh, an updated emission inventory at this time for, for MATES. And then we pull all that information together to do dispersion modeling and health risk modeling so that we can then evaluate what health risks look like in, in our region. Um, again, the study is pretty cutting edge. I'm not aware of any other region in the country that is able to do this on a regular basis. Uh, next slide. I think we'll skip to the next slide in the interest of time. Um, just to give you an overview that we've been working on MATES for many, many years, um, starting back in 1987, all the way through to our last iteration. Um, important to point out here, we typically do MATES studies every six to eight years, mostly because of the complexity and all of the resources involved in being able to do these studies. These studies tend to get more sophisticated as time goes on as well, as we have improvements in modeling and more information that we can pull in. And then note that the base years for these studies, they're usually several years before these studies are finalized, just because when we get the data all together, it takes a long time to synthesize, to go through all the modeling, and to come up with the estimates of what risks look like. Um, I think we can skip the next slide. When we, uh, so this just gives a map of where all of the monitors are. Skip again. I'll skip again. So just you know, in summary, why this takes a multiple year process, it takes a long time for us to collect the monitoring data that informs the study, go through all the work for the emissions inventory, and then go through the air dispersion modeling. Um, you know, the, um, and again, the data that we use that would inform the emission inventory, that activity data, we're still in the process of developing our 2022 AQMP. So at this point, we wouldn't have any new information that could inform this. Next slide. So in short, our recommendation is that we would start working on MATES uh, 6 after developing the 2022 AQMP. That's partly so that we have more data that can better inform that process, as well as understanding that we have a lot of other work going on right now, namely the development of the 2022 AQMP, as well as some indirect source rules and transitioning out of reclaim. And so it's tough for staff to have the resources to be able to start at this point. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the uh, committee? Yeah, Mr. Chair. Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I realize that this is a very complex uh, process and it takes a lot of staff time, but you know, technology moves very quickly and uh, it would be uh, great if we could uh, see results faster. Right now, you know, six to eight years with the way the technology moves is, uh, is you know, pretty slow. And I know it, it's complex and it takes a lot of resources, but if there's some way that we can speed up the process, uh, it would be a lot better in getting results out sooner. Thank you, Mayor. Other comments from the panel? Uh, Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, I'm sorry, I meant to lower my hand, thank you. Uh, thank you, Supervisor. We'll open this up to public comment.
Good morning, board members. My name is Sarah Wiltfong, and I'm calling on behalf of Los Angeles County Business Federation, also known as BizFed. First, I just want to thank staff for coming back to committee and providing this important update on the MAID study, which we requested at the last stationary source committee. And just really quickly, after reviewing the staff presentation, we just have a couple of observations. Um, as mentioned previously, while the study was completed in 2021, the data itself is from 2018, and we believe it's already out of date. Considering the rapid advancements in technology, as Mayor McCallum said, and additional rules that have been passed by the AQMD and CARB with more to come, we believe that the board should potentially consider doing a study every three years instead of every six to eight in order to keep the data current and ensure each new rulemaking is being considered with the most up-to-date information. We also respect that the AQMD staff is incredibly stretched thin and believe it's reasonable to start an additional study following the adoption of the 2022 AQMP. We would also like to direct the board and staff to the letter we submitted last July, which was just recirculated to you, that goes into more details on the emission reductions that have likely been achieved since 2018, including significant reductions in diesel particulate matter and other air toxics as a direct result of adoption and implementation of several state and local regulations, particularly in the on-road sector. Again, thank you for your presentation and your attention to this, and we look forward to more conversations in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bufong. Uh, and uh, uh, I haven't seen that letter. I don't know if um, that she's referring to, but we will definitely take a, a close look at it. And uh, you know, after the AQMP is done, uh, we'll figure out where we are with uh, with staffing. But let us take a look at the letter and um, and, and think through it. Other questions or comments from members of the committee? Okay, we have written reports, items four, five, six, and seven. Any questions or comments on that or anybody wanna pull it? No motions required on those. Item eight, other business, anything at this time? Item nine, general public comment. Is there anyone in the queue? No worries, hands. Okay, the next meeting date is Friday, May 20th, 2022 at 9 a.m. Most likely will be a, a hybrid meeting at that time. Anything further we need to discuss before we adjourn anybody? Mr. Executive Officer? Not at this time, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mayor? Okay, thank you all for participating. Again, have a wonderful holiday weekend for everyone. Be safe. Thank you. Meeting adjourned.